All right. What is it like to interview one of the biggest rock stars on the planet about her new winery and where she is actually the winemaker? And how about food and wine pairing myths? We're going to debunk some of those and we're going to give you some actual guidelines you can use tonight. And who are the most interesting people and places in the world of wine? Well, that's exactly what we're going to discover tonight on the Sunday Sipper Club. I'm Natalie McLean, your host, and I also offer Canada's most popular online wine classes at nataliemcclain.com. Um, and we gather every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern to interview the most interesting people in the world of wine. And our guest tonight is no exception. But before I introduce her fully, let me just reach out to you. I see you coming in our virtual wine door here. Where are you logging in from? What's in your glass? And uh, I'm always obsessed with the weather. I think it's a wine thing. I'm not sure. But I see uh, Donna and Anne McLean is here. Lori Kilmartin. Peter Nielsen is here. All right, guys. Please let me know what's in your glass. Eve Bushman is here. Hello, Eve. And Jim Clark. All right. Hello to you, Lori. Jason Davies is joining us, joining us from the UK, where he's a trooper because it's midnight his time. My goodness. Thanks for your loyalty. Deborah is here from Florida. You guys are just coming in the door constantly. Well, guys, please keep posting where you're logging in from. What's in your glass? What's it like? What's the weather like? All right, let me turn to introducing our guest this evening. You're so going to enjoy this. Um, so our guest tonight has been the wine columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle since 2015, and she covers California wine, beer, and spirits. Previously, she was an assistant editor at the Wine Spectator magazine in New York City. She's also worked harvests in Napa Valley and Mendoza, Argentina, and she studied English literature at the prestigious Smith College in Massachusetts. And she joins me now, live from her home in San Francisco. Welcome to the Sunday Sipper Club, Esther Mobley. Hello! Hi, everyone! Hi! All right, great to have you. Lots of anticipation uh, for having you here too, Esther. We really, we're glad you could take some of your Sunday to join us. I'm glad to be here. All right. Okay. So now I want to start off kind of going way back with your love of writing. Uh, let's start, well, maybe not at the beginning, but early on you had a passion for writing. And in fact, as I was doing my research for this, I discovered that your college admission essay, the one you wrote to get into college, was on the, I think, the front page or somewhere in the New York Times. Tell us about that. What, how did that get there? And uh, how did that make you feel? <laughs> was that the beginning of it all? Um, well, I, I imagine many people who love writing have loved writing from an early age. So um, I had certainly uh, been writing before that, you know, since childhood as an adolescent. Um, the, the college admissions essay was kind of a sidebar to a larger piece that the New York Times was writing then um, when I was a senior in high school about how girls were outperforming boys in school and um, girls were kind of doing, doing better, better, had a higher rate of admissions to college. I grew up in um, the suburbs of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, so that was what the piece was about, was kind of high achieving high school girls um, and the, they published to much to my continued embarrassment, my college admissions essay. <laughs> well, that sounds great. I mean, you're getting a front page coverage or whatever, but okay. So you had a love of writing. Did you ever, ever consider working in the wine industry? I mean, you're drawn to wine, obviously working in the wine industry, say as a winemaker or some other capacity versus writing about it, or did you always know you wanted to write about it? Um, I, you know, I I never thought wine would be a part of my life. It wasn't a part of my family's life growing up. Um, I had the kind of limited exposure to it that a lot of college students probably have, which involves um, getting drunk probably a lot of the time. But I, I really, there was no one in my life who kind of knew about wine or appreciated wine. Um, the way wine ended up entering my life was um, while I was a senior in college, I was having as many English majors um, probably do, especially then this was um, kind of amid the recession. Um, 
I, you know, I was just wondering, what am I going to do with my life? I, I don't know. And I figured I was going to eventually probably have some kind of boring desk job. And so I thought, what if I could do something fun to kind of travel and experience something new until that happens? And I would have joined the Peace Corps. I would have um, traveled, but I didn't want to commit to something for two years as the Peace Corps would have required. Mm -hmm. And I needed to like earn a, at least just a little bit of money just to support myself. And so somehow I figured out that you can work a uh, harvest at a winery. And frankly, to this day, I don't understand why more people don't use that as like a gap year kind of thing, because, um, you know, it's a five, six month commitment. You earn like minimum wage <laughs> and you get to experience some beautiful place. So um, I, I went to Napa the fall after I graduated from college to work a harvest season just for fun. I mean, it, I never imagined it would lead to a career or anything more than just a kind of fun excursion before I returned to, um, again, what I imagined was a life doomed to like something what I probably saw in office space. <laughs> <laughs> so glad you uh, avoided that sad existence. Yeah. But what gave you the idea for wine as opposed to going to work a farm and milk cows or, or any other gap year activity? What, what twigged you onto wine? Right. All of those things were like, I, I toured with all of those woofing, um, where you offer yourself as free labor in exchange for room and board to an organic farm. That appealed to me too. I, I loved the idea of working with my hands. The way um, it ended up being wine was that I discovered an alumna of Smith um, who had graduated uh, about 10 years earlier and was a winemaker in Napa. And her name is Helen Keplinger. She's a well-known winemaker here in California. She has her own label called Keplinger. Um, and she's been the winemaker for Bryant and uh, still is for Carte Blanche and Force Majeure. And so I, I reached out to her and she kind of helped guide me through the process of applying to harvest jobs, helped explain to me what it was. And she has remained a mentor to me ever since. Huh. That's terrific. I'm going to check in with our, our peeps now piling in still from uh, on Facebook. Anne is here from Halifax. Hello. Jim uh, is here from Markham drinking Norfolk Rise Vineyards from Benson <laughs> Shiraz. Okay, great. Elaine Bruce is here from Calgary. David Gardner and Linda Michaels has joined from Pennsylvania. Uh, welcome, Esther, says Jim Clark. Uh, let's see. Elaine Bruce uh, just in from a bike ride in Mexico. Whoa. Uh, Marie Walsh is here from Halifax, just back from an ice wine festival in Wolfville. Hello. Mm -hmm. Lori Sweet is in Kingston, and she was out to dinner in snowy Toronto. Not sure what will be in my glass. Ian Duff is here. Linda Michaels, love uh, the alumna connection. All right. <laughs> Terrific. That's great. Yeah. So, okay. So, Esther, um, was there a... a, a a wine, a pivotal wine <laughs> that you had that really turned you on to, oh my gosh, this wine, what is this? Like, this is something I need to dig into as well. Um, well, it's funny. I mean, I'm sure this is like the opposite of how it happens for most people, but I really arrived in Napa that fall. Um, not, I mean, I was so green. I, I really didn't know. And what turned me on to wine was not really, the experience of drinking wine but um helping to make wine that season and i i mean we were tasting constantly um finished wines as well as the wines we were making this was a winery in rutherford in napa valley called round pond estate so we had a huge estate vineyard about 400 acres and i was in the vineyard all the time i was working in the lab i had been an english major not really done much work um, in the sciences in college I got, a, you know, I learned how to drive a forklift and it was really the whole, um, you know, holistic experience of that rather than just one isolated uh, bottle of wine that made me fall in love with it. I love that, that you come from it at that, from that perspective of making it. Do you think that wine columnists or those who write about wine should have the experience of making it? Well, um, it's certainly helps. I mean, I rely constantly on the knowledge I gained during that and then a subsequent harvest I worked. Um, 
Although I, you know, I think as with a, a food critic, you know, it's not necessary for a food critic to be a chef. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think um, it's very possible to master your craft and have a different um, kind of critical sense of it if you haven't made it. But for me, it, it really has helped me. And um, I would not have gotten the jobs I have in writing about wine if I hadn't had that experience. So that's it. where it started. Almost yeah. George Plimpton-like, the, the writer <laughs> who used to do what he wrote about um, from football to other topics. Yeah. And then yet you can say, well, you don't have to be an arsonist to write about house fires. So there's the right. two sides of the, the argument. So from that Napa Valley Harvest, is that how you segued into a job with the wet Wine Spectator? No, it, um, that was still a little while off. So I, I um, worked that harvest in Napa and around me were people who were all applying to work harvest jobs in the Southern Hemisphere. That's of course what um, aspiring winemakers do. They gain more experience and um, kind of hop between the hemispheres. So um, suddenly everyone I knew, including my best friend from college who would come out and done this whole thing with me. She got a job at a winery in Sonoma um, and we were kind of buddies and she's still a winemaker. But um, we were applying to jobs in Australia, in New Zealand, and I ended up getting a job um, in Argentina. And um, Which at that winery? Point, it was called Bodega Roland. It's owned by Michelle Roland, ah. the consultant. Mm -hmm. um, he consults for a number of uh, properties down in Argentina, but this is one that he owns, and it's in the Uco Valley. The the um, well, they make a couple of different labels. One that's called Val de Flores, and one that's called Miraflor. You we wouldn't see a bottle that says Bodega Roland, but the way a lot of at least American wine consumers know it is that it's part of this group called the Clos de los Siete, and um, a, a few wineries that are right there next to each other blend together um, a wine they make every year. And it's like a $20 Malbec blend that sells here. Wow. OK, yeah. I'm just going to take a moment, folks, to uh, I know you're enjoying this conversation. So please take a moment to share it. So here's the share button. Just hit that comment. Tell your friends and followers why you're enjoying this conversation, whether they join us now live or catch the replay. And for those who do share, of those of you who do share and comment, we always draw for a prize. So tonight I'm going to be drawing for two prizes. So a signed copy of my book, Red, White and Drunk All Over from a couple of videos ago, as well as um, some consulting time with travel writer Stephanie Pichet on planning your next getaway. And if you share tonight's video, you'll be up for another signed copy of my book. So please do take a moment. This is such a great conversation. We've had so much good feedback on social already about this. Uh, let others know so that they can catch it live um, or watch the replay, as I as I mentioned. So Esther, um, you love storytelling. I know that you love long form narrative. What is it about digging down, digging deep that satisfies you? What? Why do you like that? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I just do. I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, there's, to me, there's nothing more satisfying than finding a great story and then, um, being able somehow to tell it. It's, I mean, I, I enjoy so much the reporting aspect of it and getting to know people, um, really trying to understand their story. That's, you know, half the writing, more than half the writing maybe. And then as I imagine a lot of other writers do, there's just something so satisfying to me about actually putting pen to paper or fingertips to keyboard and um, producing something that I'm proud of. I just, it's, yeah. it's you know, gets me high. <laughs> That's good. And so how do you get past the press release language, the, jar, the standard statements? How do you get people talking real talk, giving you a real inside story that you want. It can be, yeah, it can be tough. Um, and as I'm sure you have experienced too, there are some people who I think you kind of will never get past that with. Some people, um, I don't know, It's I'm sure it's different for every person, but whether they're not really comfortable, whether they've been given orders um, by their publicist, I think you can just tell with some people whether you're really ever going to have a genuine 
reaction, a, a kind of real interaction. Um, and so I, I really think I seek people out who I can sense I'm having a genuine connection with and I'm really speaking to. Um, and there's a lot of people out there like that. But, um, you know, I'm always polite and um, publicists can be very helpful in many ways. And, um, but, I, you know, I, I just think if there's someone who's not really giving me a real story and is just speaking in kind of PR jargon, uh, that sometimes just, I, I won't really find a way to write about it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and do you find uh, the uh, car technique helpful, interviewing people in cars? Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know I've spoken about this before in yeah. other interviews, but um, yes, I really find that that is sometimes the best way to get um, a great, great interview. You know, I used to use a voice recorder when I was doing in-person interviews, uh -huh. and I stopped doing that a couple of years ago. I found, maybe I'm wrong, but I sensed that people spoke differently when they knew they were being recorded. Mm -hmm. So I just take notes by hand um, and then do a lot of follow-up if I need to check things. I'm a pretty fast writer. Um, but similarly, with the, you know, when you're driving in the car, usually I'm in the passenger seat. And um, usually in those cases, I'm not writing at all, especially if we're like on a bumpy vineyard road. But I find that it's those long periods of time when you're not sitting at a table with wine in front of you, kind of intensely tasting, when you have a lot of extra time and you've gotten past the big questions and now you're just kind of chatting, I really find that that's when people open up and I, I seek out those moments. It can take a lot longer than just picking up the phone and doing a quick interview. And frequently that's, that's all I can do because of time and space constraints. But um, I love that car time. I really think that's when the conversation gets rich. Absolutely. Car time. I like that. It's it's when I've had the best conversations with my son, you know, when we're both mm, staring really? ahead at, yeah, it's less intense. It's less one-on-one, -on -one, eye to eye. It's like, there's something about that where it's, it's the movement, but also the focus is not directly on the other person. And it just, and then there's that, what is that um, comedy sketch? Uh, coffee in the car with I don't know. Um, oh, I don't know. You know, like Jerry Seinfeld gets in the car. Yeah, has oh, coffee yeah, 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 yeah. With other Riding comedians. Cars with comedians or something. Exactly. Yeah. And then there's the other guy who sings with the singers. Car karaoke. Exactly. Car karaoke. There's something yeah. about the car that's magical <laughs> that oh, puts people true. off the guard, uh, off their guard. So that's great. Um, and, and I know you're an avid reader of The New Yorker. So do you try to model your stories like after those in that, you know, even if I didn't have, I, or wasn't obsessed with wine, I'd still want to read a story. Like, do you take that sort of approach as well? Yes. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't flatter myself to compare my work to anything that appears in the New Yorker, but absolutely. Um, I, I have a New Yorker sitting here right in front of me, but um, that's my model that um, I want to write stories that are interesting enough that someone who's interested in great stories and interesting things would want to read it whether or not they have a deep interest in wine Absolutely. and um you know in any given issue of the new yorker i might be reading about uh, um, the oil industry in texas or deep philosophical questions about why we make decisions the way we do or sex scandals at the new york city ballet and none of those things are um topics i would you know come up with as an interest of mine but when something is written well, and when some writer has happened upon a deeply interesting subject, I think, um, you know, I want to read it. And so I want to find, I think those are the readers of the San Francisco Chronicle too, um, that our readership here in the Bay Area is smart. They're sophisticated. Many of them know something about food and wine. Um, they eat good food. They drink good wine. They visit our wine country here. Um, but I don't assume that any of my readers are deeply, um, you know, reading the online forums. And I want my stories to just be great stories to them. Absolutely. I Again, I have to concur. Um, I wanted to put on the reprint of my book, I wanted to put a quote from a reader 
who said she enjoyed my book and she's a teetotaler. <laughs> so that's but, great. But yeah, they, yeah, they wouldn't exactly. let me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I think it is a good compliment to the power of storytelling if you can reach people that way. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so um, let me just jump back into the comments because I'm getting carried away with our conversation here. And I, I want to acknowledge the people who are here. Douglas Trapasso has joined us. Hello to you. Myrna McLean is here. Peter Nielsen. Um, Ah, and Dave Head is here, who's drinking Shadow de Retoute. Um, Peter Nielsen asks, is she noticing a shift in California winemaking style? And that was kind of one of the questions I wanted to ask, Esther. I know you've been the columnist since 2015. What, what have been the major changes since you've taken helm? I know it hasn't been that long, but in the last three to four years with California wine, what's, what's changed? What's different? Um, well, I think a lot of the changes that are happening have been in the works for a long time. Of course, wine moves slowly, you just get one shot a year. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think the, the larger thing we've been seeing over the last decade is a real movement away from an era of ripeness and opulence that characterized California wine in the early 2000s. Um, everywhere I go, I'm seeing wines that are really being made with an eye toward uh, grapes being picked earlier, embracing a kind of leaner, more old fashioned profile. Um, and that, I mean, I think I knew that before I joined the Chronicle, um, three and a half years ago, but, um, I'm still seeing, that's what people want to talk to me about. Um, natural wine, um, continues to grow here. I, when I joined, I, you know, three and a half years ago, I think I might've thought that was a blip on the radar or was kind of already on its way down. And what, what we're seeing here in the Bay Area, both in terms of what restaurants and bars are serving and in terms of what California winemakers are making is um, the, the, not, the, the idea of natural wine is just on the rise a lot. And I think um, as opposed to when I joined, I, I think I might've thought that the conversation about lower alcohol was simply about picking grapes a little bit earlier. I think, and I'm going to be writing about this, I have a couple stories in the works that get at this um, in a couple of different ways. Okay. But we're, we're, we're seeing, I think, a fundamental shift in questioning what's supposed to be planted where. We're seeing more grapes like Gamay and Sinso, kind of lighter bodied wines. Um, I think there's more interest in that. And uh, we'll see how things progress over time. But um, I do think we're, we're, we're in the midst of a long ranging shift. Shift toward more uh, lower alcohol, more elegance, that kind of thing? Yes. And okay. I, I, I doubt that would be news to many of your readers. Again, sure. I think we've been um, hearing about that and tasting that for a few years now. But I really see its momentum not, you know, I think it's still um, moving. Absolutely. And natural wine, you mentioned that. So I just want your take on that. Uh, some people call it a fad. Others say it's a, you know, good move toward non-interventionism. <laughs> what, what is your take on not natural wine? You know, um, I'm still formulating my take on natural wine, partially because I have yet to fully understand what natural wine really is. I think it's frustrating. We don't have a, a kind of strict definition of it, although maybe that's the beauty of it. You know, I, um, a few years ago, I think I had a much more negative sense of what natural wine was. Maybe that was because my initial exposures to wine were making, making wine, wine that um, certainly didn't feel industrial or over manipulated, but embraced the use of sulfur as a preservative and embraced fining and filtration. And um, I added DAP to, to kickstart yeast. I added, I inoculated um, fermentations with commercial yeast. And I just thought these wines aren't any less soulful for it. Um, and I remain a little bit unconvinced by the, the notion that sulfur is a poison mm -hmm. to you. I, I know a lot of people in the natural wine world believe that. I, I'm not sure I do, but I'm certainly all for um, safer and more sustainable practices in the vineyard. And I wish that were more at the center of the natural wine conversation here in California. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it just simply makes better wine and we need to be thinking about the future of the land. 
Um, when it comes to the wines themselves, I'm interested in them the way I'm interested in any other wine. And I think a lot of them, a lot of natural wines that have things we might have, many of us might consider flaws. Um, I think they're really challenging the notion of, of what wine is supposed to be. And I sometimes struggle to enjoy a wine that has like acetic acid or volatile acidity, of course. But um, the fact that so many other people seem to be interested in them makes me curious and want to understand what the appeal is. And I'm just trying to remain an open-minded drinker. There you go. That's good. A uh, beginner or enthusiast mind is always refreshing. Uh, and they say there's more sulfites in, um, what is it? Yeah. A, a glass of orange juice than a bottle of wine. Right. And people eat dried apricots and, um, yeah, but you know, i I know a lot of people, um, it's hard to argue with empirical evidence of what people say they experience when they've had something, you know, I, I believe people and, um, so I'm, I certainly don't consider myself the expert on any of this, but right. I mean, I, I eat dried fruit, I drink orange juice and, um, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, there, we probably all consume a lot of things in our daily lives that we need to uh, scrutinize more closely. Perhaps just not wine, leave that off the yeah. table. As I tell my doctor regularly, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so let's turn to an organic wine producer, a winemaker you interviewed, um, I guess recently in, in 2018, Alicia Moore. Mm -hmm. So tell me about Alicia Moore. What drew you to this story? How did you find out about Alicia Moore, this California winemaker? Um, it's a funny story. So um, Alicia Moore is better known as Pink, the musician. Yes. Um, so uh, her, her publicist is someone I um, have known for a while and I've worked with on other stories and um, someone I really trust and... Um, know, understands what I do and um, the kinds of stories I tell. So this woman um, had reached out to me several times and kind of explained that she has this new client and um, never mentioned Pink. Uh, initially didn't even mention the name Alicia Moore and was simply telling me I have this client who has this really exciting new estate in um, Santa Barbara County the wines are really beautiful. They're getting released. And I, you know, it sounded like a, a ambitious project, but not necessarily any more interesting than any other thoughtfully uh, planned new estate vineyard. And um, I was kind of talking to her about it. And I said, okay, I'll, you know, I'm going to come down to Santa Barbara anyway, I'll come down. And it was truly only after having um, committed already to go down there that I put the pieces together. I mean, I think the name Alicia Moore had been mentioned somewhere in there and I Googled, you know, it looked, it's spelled unconventionally for Alicia. I Googled it and I was like, oh my gosh, this is pink. <laughs> so, um, you know, maybe that was the grand tactic the whole time because um, I, I, you know, I, Alicia clearly really wants to be taken seriously as a winemaker and, and does, does not, not want her wines to rest on um, her music career. Obviously so, that she didn't yeah. launch a rosé, call it pink and call it a day. <laughs> right. And um, she could have a lot of, uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm sure she could have a lot of success that way. But, um, you know, the one thing that I, I really came to understand as I then met her and visited her vineyard and spent time with her there and tasted her wines was that um, she's, she's really aching to be um, a true part of the wine community and um, has, you know, I really believe she has a lot of respect for her fellow winemakers. She has really tried to ingratiate herself into the community down there and she's trying to do something in a real and thoughtful way. Absolutely aching. I love that. She really is yearning, isn't she? It's yeah. not only an organic winery. Her name is not associated with the label, which is Two Wolves. But she is serious. She's not just another celeb label slapping her. Well, she doesn't have her name on the label or even owning the winery. Um, she's actually taken some serious wine trading. What has she done to, to train herself? 
She took a number of WSET classes. I don't know now um, to what level, but um, I had never known that. I mean, she was describing having to like leave concerts in Australia, which is where her biggest fan base is, incidentally, mm -hmm. um, and running backstage still in her leotard to go take her WSET exam online. I mean, <laughs> who knew? Wow. Um, and she had traveled extensively to wine regions. Um, she loves Chateauneuf de Pop. She loves Australian wine, uh, New Zealand wine. She spent a lot of time in Oregon and the Willamette Valley. Hmm. So um, she, she loves Clover Jard. I mean, I've interviewed a lot of um, celebrity winemakers uh, and celebrities who purport to be interested in wine. That was a little column I did at Wine Spectator actually, but um, I had not encountered anyone who knew or had visited a winery as kind of insidery and um, as Clover Jard. I mean, you yeah. kind of have to like know kind of hipster. about- <laughs> Yeah, you have to like know something about wine to know that's cool. It's not just like- Sasakaya um, or it, whatever. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Um, so I was, uh, you know, I was very impressed by that. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, she has a desire, it seems, because she was off the grid for five years doing this winery. Of course, her children were young, but she really yeah. seemed to dig in. She's she's not just the owner. She's actually the winemaker, which just surprised me to no end. Right. And she does have a really talented um, and experienced kind of on the ground winemaker um, named Allison Thompson, who I've mm -hmm. written about um who's there day to day uh because you know um alicia was on tour for much of this year but she's she's like out there picking the grapes i mean i kind of wanted to say to her like do you know most winemakers aren't out there picking the grapes that's not like part of the job description you can hire to people do to do that <laughs> yeah yeah that's funny um, wow but yeah i i you know i i think i have a pretty good bullshit detector i hope i do and uh -huh. um it didn't go off when I was with her. Wow. I, I really sensed that she um, cared about this and she seemed nervous during our interview, really nervous. Like wow. she was really hoping that she could be recognized for doing this, in, you know, not just as a kind of helicopter and celebrity. Absolutely. Well, you know, she joins the Pantheon, I guess. Uh, British pop star Mike Hucknall didn't call his wine Simply Red. And Brangelina, you know, they didn't put their name on Miravel, though I don't know post-divorce who got custody of that uh, French yeah, winery. I, I, <laughs> that's still a, a news topic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, it's it's interesting that she is she's really digging in there and and trying to produce something and almost i don't know maybe as you i don't know if it was the grand strategy of not revealing who it was behind this winery but um until you know it had to be revealed and she i guess she sold out of her wine i guess it was only 115 cases but in 24 right. hours do you think that people are just knew who she was then and would, that it was a celebrity bump yeah i mean it's you know, I'm sure she has some really devoted fans of her music, and I'm sure that many of them um, were eager to taste her wine. I, sure. You know, I have no doubt. Um, and again, right, it wasn't very much wine. So um, it, it, you know, you wouldn't have expected it to take a long, long time to sell mm -hmm. that much. Um, but, you know, I, I imagine, too, that there was a lot of curiosity around, um, you know, she sounds like she's serious. Uh, if people had read my or other articles that came out subsequently, um, I imagine there was a lot of curiosity of like, are these wines really good? And um, Allison, her assistant winemaker, is beloved in the Santa Barbara County wine community and known. Um, Alicia got a kind of the most coveted wine label designer in California, Michael mm -hmm. McDermott, to do the labels. Um, she certainly associated herself with. Um, people who are well-respected in the California wine industry yeah, too. As opposed to just a marketing focus group. So the, the, right. the two wolves comes after the Cherokee parable, you know, of the two wolves that fight inside each of us, which one wins? One represents light or dark or our better impulses, our worse impulses. And, you know, the, the elder Cherokee chief is trying to instruct his grandson and he says, which, which wolf wins or survives? He says, the one you feed. Um, do you think there's uh, anything in terms of Alicia choosing that, 
the, the being torn between two identity the pop star and the winemaker i mean is there anything or am i just reading too much into it well um I, that's how i interpreted it okay. um and uh i asked her that i can't remember i don't think i got a super straight answer from her about it okay if i do i'm i'm forgetting but um yeah that's how i interpreted it that um there's you know she's a person of paradoxes and yes. contains multitudes <laughs> absolutely well she she's been my her songs have been my anthem for years from sober yeah. to raise a glass <laughs> yeah exactly, morning to night exactly. <laughs> but um, let's just check in with our uh folks here who are still coming in it's terrific to have you guys here um james norton has joined us Douglas, can you update us on the fires? Okay, yes, let's get to that. Sam Hawk, who teaches wine classes in Vancouver, is here. He says, I agree with Esther. There is a lot of misinformation floating out there. Michelle or Michael Perilous has joined. Linda says, I appreciate Esther's authenticity. She gives you, four, you. four glasses, <laughs> I would assume, out of four. Um, <laughs> Louise Valbuza, can Alicia's wines be considered biodynamic as well? So do you um, know if they're not? I don't think she's practicing strict biodynamic practices. No. Okay, yeah. Um, I just yeah. read their organic. Um, okay. Dave Head says, we were at Sir Cliff Richards Winery in Al." Algrave. The and Al mm -hmm. Yes. He um, also does not have his name on the winery. Decent Juice. And Linda Alexander has joined us from Virginia. All right. So um, let's turn to another California wine, um, Esther. The Miomi brand, which you wrote about, and it's it's an interesting paradox. Yeah. Like, yeah. So it's sold to the conglomerate Constellation, which used to own Artira here in Canada, Jackson mm -hmm. Triggs, Inniskillen, lots of big brine brands. It sold for $315 million without any assets, no vineyard, nothing in 2015. What was your take on that? Um, to me, that's just fascinating that um, anything could sell that basically has no physical inventory. It's just a brand um, for $315 million. So I, I was fascinated by that and wrote a big profile of Joe the next year um, simply because I thought, you know, what does this signify for California moving forward? And I mean, he's a fascinating character to me for a number of reasons. Um, he comes from, of course, this kind of California wine dynasty. His father, um, Chuck Wagner, owns Camus. Um, his other siblings have also gone off kind of from the Camus diaspora and made their own wines. And, um, you know, Joe Wagner was kind of right there with his original Pinot Noir label, Belle Gloss, in the wake of Sideways um, and this kind of huge California Pinot Noir craze that followed. So uh, to me, there's a lot of uh, fascinating threads that he kind, kind of, of intersects. Um, and this year, uh, well, in late 2018, he was in the news quite a lot again um, because for two reasons. He now has an Oregon, uh, he has a couple of brands based on Oregon Pinot Noir. Okay. And um, there was a lot of, there was a lot of uproar in Oregon over how he was labeling his wines that um, he was uh, potentially not really authorized according to our Appalachian rules to use the term Willamette Valley on his bottles. Um, similarly, uh, he um, canceled a number of contracts with growers in Southern Oregon, um, citing smoke taint. Hmm. There had been massive wildfires in Southern Oregon, and um, a lot of growers felt like he had left them high and dry at the last minute um, and couldn't sell their grapes. Anyway, hmm. there's a lot more to all of those stories, but um, he's a person who's, uh, well, I don't, I don't know, he's an important, an interesting figure in in West Coast wine right now. Yeah. You know, maybe not all for the right reasons, but interesting nonetheless. And when it comes to Miomi, do you think Miomi as a brand is good for California wine? When we think, you, you hear the statements over and over again, wines made in the vineyard and, you know, non-interventionists, all this. This is a winery that got sold without a vineyard. I mean, I, sure, they got grapes from contractors, but is that... I know it depends on how you define authentic, but is that an authentic wine? What is that? 
Um, well, uh, Naomi is not an authentic wine, no matter how you cut it. I, I don't think I could make that argument. Um, it's, you know, I, I don't know the percentages offhand, but it's like got Gewürztraminer and Grenache in it. I mean, it's, huh. it's labeled as Pinot Noir. It, it has at least 75% Pinot Noir, but, um, it's got these other kind of crazy blends. Uh, to me, it's not a great example of kind of California Pinot Noir varietal character. Um, but of course it's, it's massively popular. You know, um, the New York Times wine columnist Eric Asimov recently had a piece in which he suggested that his readers go out and buy Mayomi Pinot Noir and two other popular supermarket wine brands. Mm -hmm. um, and that caused a bit of an uproar. A lot of people said, how could you endorse a wine like this? And I don't think he was endorsing it. I think he just thought it would be an interesting and instructive exercise to see what is, you know, this is one of the most popular wines in America. Hmm. Um, and I, you know, I, whether it's good for California wine, I don't know. I, I think, you know, there's an argument to be made for that wine being a kind of gateway wine to other California Pinots. Um, it's an affordable wine ish. It's about $20 a bottle. Uh, I actually think you can get better, more interesting wines for much less than that here. Um, but you know, I think it's when a wine like that becomes so massively popular, it, it, it warrants our attention. We should all be thinking what, what does this mean? And how is this influencing people and other wines? What do you think it means? What, what happened? What caused its popularity? I mean, I, you know, I think it's the same thing that has, I, so I think a, a number of things. Um, I think Pinot Noir is still riding a big wave of popularity. And um, Mayomi is an example of a Pinot Noir that uh, has the heft and alcohol content of a bigger, fuller bodied wine, but still has um, a lot of fruit. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know off the top of my head, whether it's dry. I, I certainly haven't had it tested. It doesn't taste entirely dry to me. So um, I think it's it, it's a wine that capitalizes on a mass markets demand for sweeter, um, really boldly flavored wines, which I don't think is new to Mayomi. I think that's a tried and true recipe that's been around for quite a while. Absolutely. All right. So we, I wanted to also get to some of these um, food and wine pairings that you've been exploring. You had uh, you did a seminar with the science or technical writer at the oh, yeah. Chronicle. Um, who was that? Remind me of that writer's name. His name is Ali Buzari. He's okay. um, he's a food scientist here locally, and he writes a column once a month for us on the side. Ah, great. And so you two were exploring food and wine pairing myths and pairing guidelines. What what did you come up with there? What what is <laughs> what is bunk and what what could work? What could help us? Well, um, yeah, this was actually just three or four days ago that oh. um, we did this presentation. Um, there's a lot of things, I, you know. Um, I learned a lot from Ali just about the kind of science behind flavor. I think many of your your listeners may be aware that our tongue um, is capable of really only tasting five things. So they say, um, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, the five tastes: sweet, salty, uh, sour, bitter, and umami. Whereas our nose um, is capable of of detecting infinitely more. Um, molecules mm -hmm. and what we what we ultimately perceive in our palate when we're tasting wine or anything else is, is a composite image from our tongue and our nose which we're you know smelling retronasally um, and that's what we end up uh, perceiving as flavor is is all of that kind of taken together um, you know, one thing Ali um, was explaining a lot is that, um, and I, you know, maybe this sounds obvious, but it really is all subjective. And for instance, um, the famous experiment where someone takes a glass of white wine and puts red food coloring in it, and then the so-called expert tasters perceive it as a red wine. I, I, I don't think that disproves their expertness. Um, we really are tasting with our eyes and our 
our sense of touch um, and our ears as much as with our nose and our mouth. And um, uh, the, the color, color red, red is sending real signals to our brain. I mean, mm -hmm. we're not like making it up when we see something red and have a kind of taste memory that we associate with that. Our brain is giving us a powerful, or it's giving our brain a powerful message. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, and they've done studies too where they'll do a test and they'll write the word say blue, but the letters will be in red. And there's a significant slowdown on the response time of people trying to read the words because we do, we do perceive with our eyes uh, for sure. It has a yeah. real impact. Yeah, and if you're warm, if you you know, if you're touching something soft, it it, it I mean, it plays a role and um, we're kind of helpless to all the signals we're getting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and there's crossover between the senses too, which I find interesting when they start to you know play certain music and then drink the wine yeah. and it affects your perception of the wine. Um, they compete. They do. Cross-modal. That cross-modal yeah. in interpretation is a whole new field. So what, uh, what food and wine pairing myths did you debunk? Um, um, anything that comes to mind, like as the big ones? Well, you know, one thing is there's this um, idea of super tasters. Mm -hmm. And have, I don't know if you've spoken about this before, but um, I had originally once thought that super tasters actually had like more taste buds than um, non tasters. But uh, as Ali explained the other day, all that all it means is that um, there's a certain bitterness compound yep. that super tasters are very sensitive to. Yeah, you, many of your listeners may know this already. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, it makes a lot of foods quite unpleasant for them. Um, and I, so I think it's a myth that a super taster is a better wine taster or would be a better chef for instance, mm -hmm. um, than a non-taster. In fact, the non-tasters may actually, A, experience more pleasure out of a greater range of foods and wines, but also um, might be better at, you know, because they they can experience a fuller array of flavors than super tasters who end up kind of being pickier. Right, right. Be more yeah. like of the populace to recommend wines. Right, yeah. right. And, you know, what about the whole red wine steak? Like um, the Tim Hanai in California says, it's not about proteins binding to tannins. It's about how much salt you put on your steak. That's what's taming the, mm. the flavors in the steak going with the wine. Did you guys explore any of that? Well, we, not, we didn't talk about that specifically, but um, one fascinating thing we did was that um, we put two glasses of water in front of everyone. Uh-huh. One had a little bit of salt in it, and one had a lot of salt in it. So when you tasted the first one that had a little bit of salt, we all tasted it. And I mean, it tastes gross. It's salt water. Um, but it, I mean, it tasted salty. Then you taste the second one, which is um, much saltier, and swish it around in your mouth, swish it around in your mouth. And when you go back to the first glass, um, it actually tasted sweet. Huh just the the relative saltiness of one to the other resulted in something that actually tasted sweet. It was crazy because a moment before that same glass of wine had tasted really pretty salty. So um, to me, that just has all kinds of implications for the way we taste wine and food together. The, the crazy importance of the context and going between one thing and another. Absolutely. And, yeah, another thing we did was... Um, we had a lightly sweet wine. It was a Moscato with a very, very sweet um, butterscotch pudding. So um, both the wine and the food were sweet, but the food was much sweeter than the wine. And the food, I mean, this maybe is obvious to many of your readers, but the food really makes the wine so bitter. Hmm. I, I would have ordered those together in a restaurant, right? A kind of sweet, light, sweet dessert wine with um, a sweet dessert. But um, the degree of sweetness of the food can really, really throw the wine out of whack, even if it's already sweet. Hmm, absolutely. I have to concur. And we were talking about this earlier. But, you know, when I sit down, taste maybe 40, 50 wines, it's like it's always by comparison. What did you taste before this wine? And what did yeah. you taste after? It can just totally throw your perception. And and many is a time I've bought a wine that I wanted for personal consumption that I had a tasting 
at the tasting, it was great, but it was like, you know, as I said, meeting a guy in a bar, it's a noisy bar <laughs> and he's great. He's telling you fun stories. Then you get him home and he doesn't lower his voice. It's not the inside voice. It's still loud. And right. It's like, what was I thinking taking this guy home? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, well, um, yeah. Like, uh, Ali was, was bringing up the example of someone, um, visiting a tasting room at a winery where you're surrounded by beautiful scenery and mm. you're you're seeing all these other people enjoying the wine and you love the wine and you buy the wine and then you get it back to your like small dirty apartment and yeah. you're like this tastes terrible what and happened? duh I mean it's context tastes a lot better when exactly. you're sitting on a patio in beautiful Napa Valley exactly context the wine hasn't changed you have <laughs> right yeah right and so that's real it's not you know we're yeah. not making it up in our yeah. heads our bodies are performing this complicated dance absolutely the dance absolutely all right let me just check back in here folks as we are starting to wrap up because this has been a great conversation um andrea is here and Lori. um Wow, so many great questions, um, Mike. And yet we've, wow, we're almost at the hour. Holy smokes. Okay, so folks, um, let me just remind you again, even though we are nearing the end here, take a moment to share this video, especially if you've enjoyed it. Comment, because as you know, uh, we always draw for a prize. If you do, I'll be announcing two winners tonight, but people can always catch the replay. This has been a fabulous conversation. So why not take a moment to share it and comment on why you enjoyed it? Now, Esther, um, as we come to a close here, is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to mention at this point? Oh, let's see. What were we going to talk about? <laughs> um, so many things. Yeah. We covered a lot. Um, well, oh, one thing you you asked if was if any of my stories resulted in any concrete changes. Yes, to the and, oil industry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think they're well. I, I, anyway, at the risk of um, just sounding self promotional, but one one interesting thing that I think came out of something um, was about a year and a half ago, I discovered that Constellation, the same company that had uh, bought Naomi from Joe Wagner, had filed a trademark um, for a new wine winery called Tokalon Wine Company. And of course, Tokalon is a famous vineyard in Napa um, that uh, has been in existence since the 19th century and is owned by multiple entities. Um, no one owns it entirely, but Robert Mondavi, which is owned by Constellation, Constellation. owns a portion of it a well-known grape grower named Andy Beckstoffer owns mm -hmm. a portion of it. And there have been many trademark battles in the past between these um, owners who argue over who really has the right to use the name Tokalon. Robert Mondavi holds a trademark, but um, Andy Beckstoffer has sued him, has sued the winery Constellation over it before. Huh. Um, anyway, so uh, Constellation have come out with this, um, and they filed a trademark to start a new wine label just called Tokalon that oh. was going to be separate from Robert Mondavi Winery. Okay. Um, and I reported on that, which again, I think raises all these interesting questions about who has the right to call their wine that. Does the place name um, transcend any trademark rights? Mm -hmm. And subsequently, they withdrew their request for a oh. trademark. Wow, congratulations. So, well, I don't, it, you know, no, I don't have a stake in it, but I thought it was really interesting. That, yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. That is a huge company. Constellation, as I said, used to own Artira Wines here in Canada, which is just, it. they represent here in Canada, Robert Mondavi, Kim Crawford, Rafino, Jackson Triggs, yeah. Inneskillen. They're a huge, huge company. Um, so that is interesting that they backed off on that. Uh, wow, that's good though. Like it's, I, I think place deserves more than just a marketing trademark it really it's beyond that it should it should yeah. be yeah well i think um especially you know napa valley itself and many of its wineries are really kind of trademarked up mm -hmm. they the napa valley itself has a trademark and they're oh. really vigilant about um people using it uh inappropriately there was a whole thing um, back in the 90s here with um, Bronco Wine Company owned right. by Fred Franzia calling something Napa Cellars, even though it was made over in like Fresno, basically. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, I think it'll be interesting to watch over the coming decades if we see anything more concrete. I mean, it's hard to imagine us developing a kind of burgundy-like cruise system, mm -hmm. but um, a vineyard like Tokalon, where like burgundy, a lot of different uh, people have different pieces of this famous vineyard. Yeah. You know, it, 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 again, to me, it raises a lot of interesting questions. Absolutely. Well, it's the antithesis. It's the Tokalon reminds me of Claude de Vougeot in Burgundy, which has right. like seven, 82 owners. Everyone has a tiny a bit. Mind. Yes. Versus yeah. we are going through the same thing here in Canada. We have cellared in Canada. So the juice can be from anywhere. People think they're buying a Canadian product. It's very misleading. And, you know, there's a lot of fight now to just get that done away with that whole designation of seller in Canada. So yeah, like it's interesting. Napa. Wow. Okay. So Esther, where can we find you online? Um, you can find me at sfchronicle.com. Okay. Uh, sfchronicle.com slash wine to be precise. Mm -hmm. um, if you're ever in California, you can find me in the Sunday print, San Francisco Chronicle. We've got it today. All right. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Esther Mob, E S T H E R M O B, on Twitter at Esther underscore Mobley. Um, and I also keep a repository of my work at EstherMobley.com. Fantastic. Esther, what a great conversation. It's gone by in Thank a snap. A yeah. Fantastic story. So I look forward to staying in touch and, and perhaps getting you back here if uh, you have the time, because there's so many more questions I wanted to ask you. And I, the questions are still coming in from the folks on uh, on Facebook. So, but thank you for being great. here. Yeah, and, it's uh, been a pleasure. Thanks right. for tuning in. Absolutely. So we'll say bye for now. And uh, we'll be following your work online, Esther. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, folks, stay with me here for a moment now while I um, draw for our winners. Let me go back to your comments here. Um, Jamal has joined. Uh, Gus. Hello, Gus. The column. Huh? Thank you. March 13th. Okay, Gus is a a uh, syndicated wine columnist in Texas. And he, he and I have connected recently. He reached out and he's writing an article. So you need to look up Gus online as well as Esther. Um, Guillaume, thanks for the interview. Pre-Oscar, great pre-Oscar. I know, I'm so excited for the Oscars. Woohoo! Paul, Patty and I, okay, yeah, you guys watched the replay. Okay, so guys, I'm going to ask Esther to jump in and still answer your questions after this. So no worries, you can still keep commenting. And of course, if you're watching the replay, keep commenting. We still check in throughout the week. And that is what we also do to draw for the winner. So take a moment as we wrap up and share this post. I'm gonna draw for two winners in, three, in two minutes right now and say why you enjoyed this conversation uh, with your friends and followers, all right? So drawing for two winners. One is a signed copy of my book for sharing one of the videos. I think the one that, where I was doing open mic night two weeks ago. And then four weeks ago, we had Stephanie Pichet, who's a expert travel writer. And she um, is giving a 30 minute free consult on food and wine gastronomic travel. So our winners are, drum roll. <laughs> doo -doo -doo. Um, for a signed copy of my book, let me just toggle back to the name here. I have got uh, Catherine Fleming in Montreal. Congratulations, Catherine. Thank you. And uh, for the winner for Lori, or Stephanie Pichet's um, free consult, Lori Sweet, which is interesting because Lori also writes about travel. So the two of you should have fun connecting on the travel, gastronomic travel scene. So guys, those are our two winners, but I'm also going to draw for a winner if you share tonight's video next week another signed copy of Red, White and Drunk All Over. Sorry, in two weeks time, we're every second week. All right, so um, we will be having, I'm trying to remember our next guest. I think it might be Rajat Parr from San Francisco. Sommelier extraordinaire has written a book, The Atlas of Taste. Um, he'll be coming up and uh, you can always find all of our upcoming guests on uh, the website, nataliemcclain.com forward slash videos. And if you want to take your tasting game to the next level, join me on a free online class, wine tasting class, Natalie McLean 
forward slash pro. All right, guys, as always, thank you for taking a portion of your Sunday and spending it with me. Hope you enjoy the Oscars or something else if you're ignoring the Oscars. Uh, at least you've got your wines poured and you're ready to go. So um, this is the highlight of, of what I do. I love it. And I will see you again in two weeks time. Take care and bye for now.